Hi, I'm Thomas Lewis. I'm a cloud developer advocate here at Microsoft Build Live. And uh, I have the uh, wonderful uh, opportunity to uh, talk to my guest, who is Duncan Lawler. Um, you're a principal software engineering manager. Did I get that right? Yep. OK, good, good. Um, and so today, what we were going to do was to talk about uh, something that your team um, has built. You've already uh, announced it, but you're talking about it a bit more here um, at Build. Uh, so tell me what, what you've built. Yeah, so what we just announced is uh, a map control for the Unity development environment. It's primarily targeted for mixed reality or augmented reality scenarios. And it's used for uh, applications to be able to put together a virtual tabletop map, like you see in sci-fi movies. Right. Oh, very cool. Um, when I saw it, I thought that it was really interesting because uh, I always called these things uh, 3D islands, right? They're mm -hmm. like this, this little square. Um, now, we've seen other Bing map controls um, in the past. And how is this one particularly different than what we've had to, already in 3D? Well, the map control for Unity is most closely related to the map control that's built into Windows in terms of the 3D functionality it has. Uh, but the main target for this is mixed reality, which none of the other map controls currently have. So all of the controls will support the same basic geospatial functionality. You can view any part of the world and do your own overlays on them. But this one allows you to give you the full stereo immersive visualization. Interesting. Um, and so why did you in particular uh, think of Unity as, as, the, as where to have this component sort of drop into? Well, this actually, we, we experimented with a couple of different options before we settled on Unity. What we found out is that uh, most developers who are targeting mixed reality were using the Unity development environment. It's just very friendly to a developer to be able to very quickly put together an application that has rich visualizations. And when we looked at what was out there, uh, there was really no solution for displaying real-world data within a Unity context. And especially, there was no way for a developer to put together something very simply. Everything that was out there was kind of custom build your own. And what we were really aiming for here was a single component that you could just drop in and have a fully functional map working. OK, so, so I, I don't have to sort of do uh, you know, pull from GitHub, do a certain set of builds, and then go to Unity and ask them, hey, can I, can I put this in? It's just sort of a drag and drop plugin? Yeah, you just download the Unity component. Once you have that, you add it to a game object as a map renderer component, and you've got a fully functional visual map. You don't have to do any customization with scripts or anything. You just uh, call the API on the map control. You tell it the location on the world you want to look at and the level of detail that you want to view. And it'll handle downloading all of the data and making it visible to the user. Oh, that's very interesting. Very interesting. Now, what I've sort of seen in the past a lot of times with controls, especially with mapping technology, is usually you have to get sort of a uh, some kind of license, right? So you get the license, you sign up to be a part of a thing, and it's usually like a business contract that you have to go through. Um, have we? Is it pretty much the same thing for us with this? Yeah, the licensing model that the uh, mixed reality map control uses is the same as all of the other licensings for our, our uh, big maps controls. You sign up for a developer account, you get an application key, and you provide that application key to the control on startup. After that, um, we have a very free, a very generous free terms of use where you can have a certain number of sessions. After that, you pay per session. And it's the same key that you can use for all of the other uh, Bing Maps services that are online, all of our REST services like geocoding, direction, search, et cetera. Oh, so if they already have signed up for, for the Bing Map services, this is in, it, in addition, you, you get it for free comparatively. Well, up, up to a certain transaction limit, okay. there's a free terms of use. And then beyond that, you pay on a per session basis. Oh, OK. Very interesting. Um, so what are, the, what are the platforms that are targeted with this? Is this something I can only use in a Windows context? Currently, um, when you embed it in a Windows application, in a Unity scene, um, you have to say what you're targeting. And we support all of the mixed reality devices that are available on the Windows platform, so all of the Windows mixed reality headsets and other headsets like the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive. And you can also build for the HoloLens 1 and 2. Uh, we don't support the AR kit and AR core on Android and iOS yet, but it's something we're considering. Oh, OK. And so, so with Windows, it's not just sort of the, the sort of desktop apps, but it's you know, HoloLens, Windows Mixed Reality. Um, and then did you also say Oculus or any Yeah, of it should support any of the headsets oh, okay. that run on the Windows platform. Oh. And you could also build the desktop app with it. There's no restriction on it. Um, 
but it's primarily targeted more for mixed reality scenarios. Right. Oh, okay. Um, and so with using Unity, because a lot of the folks that are interested in mixed reality spend a lot of time um, in Unity. Um, and so how does it integrate with other components? You were talking a little bit about sort of the game object. And so maybe for folks who don't use Unity and we're like, hey, game objects, of course everybody knows what that is. How would you explain like what a game object is and then why is it interesting that you know, your, your component can actually attach to that? In the Unity development environment, it's a visual tree where everything is a game object or a child of a game object. So it's a hierarchical visual tree. Um, the way the map control works is it attaches to a game object and then it takes over the rendering for that object. And then you can take any other game object you put in your Unity scene and you can request that it be attached to the map control. At that point, the map control takes over the position and the scaling of, of the rendering that game object and automatically makes it sync with the map control. So when you ask the map control to zoom to a new location, it'll handle moving that object to that new location as well. Um, and, and, and does it this, do the same thing for the camera? So like I, I noticed here in the, uh, the animation we have behind us, um, you have the ability to go from like one place, maybe like the Seattle Space Needle to uh, Gasworks, but uh, do you have the ability to also have the camera uh, do sort of the same thing where if I want to look at a different view of it, um, it can control the camera as well? Sure. Um, so the, in Unity, you have control over the position of the camera. In a mixed reality context, typically the position of the camera is controlled by the user's head. Right. So if you wanted to look at the other side of the map, you would just walk around and look at the other side of the map. Ah, got it, got it. Um, so we have this uh, mixed reality toolkit uh, that we uh, contribute to. It's, it's open source as well. Um, and a lot of folks in mixed reality are using that uh, toolkit. Um, does this interact with that toolkit? And if you can, um, tell me what the toolkit actually does for the people who may not know. The mixed reality toolkit is a great uh, set of code that Microsoft has released as open source to help you provide user interface within a mixed reality context. A lot of uh, Unity developers have a problem of putting up just simple UI things. And in mixed reality, it's even harder because there's no fixed interaction model. There's no equivalent of a list box. Right. And what the mixed reality uh, toolkit has tried to do is provide that for developers. And so our map control integrates well with that. As a matter of fact, the demo application that we put together, which you can download from the Microsoft Store right now, it's called Outings. Um, or if you want to wander over to our booth, you can see it live. Uh, it uses the Mixed Reality Toolkit for all of the UI surrounding the map and then has the map control interacting with that. So as you select items from the Mixed Reality Toolkit UI, the map control responds to that. Oh, interesting. Um, and so the map control, I'm assuming, uh, pulls from Bing Data. Like, what, what are the data sources that I have available to me? Like, can I have flat models if I wanted to? Like, could I change from 2D to 3D within that construct? or? The data that the control uses is the same data that the Windows control uses. The, and it's primarily three main data types that we pull from. The most detailed data that we have is our textured 3D city models, uh, which we have up, they're very high resolution up to five centimeters per pixel. And we have those for about 400 cities in the world. Outside of these detailed city model areas, uh, we have an elevation model for the world, and it's a seamless global elevation, so there's no cliffs or you know, islands of right. no data. The resolution varies depending on where you're looking at, from about 30 meters to 60 meters at a minimum, to about one meter uh, per sample. On top of that, we will take orthographic aerial imagery that comes from either planes or satellites, and is typically at least 50 centimeters per pixel. And uh, that gives you a general feel for natural terrain features, at least. OK. And, and those numbers, I, some people probably are going to be like, well, what does that mean, actually? So like, if you were to put it sort of in layman's terms, I mean, does, is that like, wow, I'm getting like really, really deep, um, you know, clear views of the thing that I'm looking at? Is it like, oh, you're going to be like 20,000 miles in space looking down at this little uh, cube? Yeah, for five centimeters per pixel, you could see objects as small as this on that's the That's amazing. And is, is that something that's just sort of available to everybody? Like, do all of the mapping providers you know, give you that sort of depth? There are very few companies in the world that have this level of detail of data. Oh, OK. Um, it basically, this map control is backed by petabytes of data that are seamlessly streamed across global data centers with millisecond latencies around the world. 
Wow. And, and, and I would assume because that's all of the work that you all have been doing with uh, Bing overall. Right. Oh, that's a. That's amazing. I, I think, yeah, sometimes a lot of folks uh, don't realize that, you know, number one is this data is huge, right? And mm -hmm. you all have had to figure out, like, hey, how do we, how do we deal with this amount of data? Um, and then, again, to get that kind of precision um, takes a huge amount of uh, effort. And what is the, I mean, what's the size of a team to do this kind of thing? Well, when we were producing the data, we scaled up the team a bit, and we had a team of about 200 people that were primarily dedicated just to the production of the detailed 3D city areas. And the, the cities that you have, you said there's 400 cities, right? We have about 400 cities worldwide. They're mostly in North America and Western Europe and Australia as well. Um, but the scale of the data is a little unprecedented. You know, I like to think of it in terms of uh, there's been a lot of press around these large open world games, and some of them have talked about you know, how huge the areas they have modeled 3D data for. Um, the largest games out there have areas around 100 square kilometers in size. Our smallest city is bigger than 100 square kilometers. Our largest city areas are on the order of 8,000 square kilometers. Oh, wow. And we have a total detailed 3D modeled area on the order of 150,000 square kilometers. And unlike a game where they can reuse the same textures and models, Every pixel is unique in all of that data. So the scale is just amazing. Yeah. And, and are you, are you, is the plan to like add more cities as, as you go? Yeah, we typically look at refreshing our data every three to five years. Uh, and our focus area for data collection is primarily on where the populated centers are. Mm -hmm. And I would estimate in the United States, for example, uh, well, the surface area that we have covered compared to the surface area of the United States is not large. In terms of the population coverage, we probably have more than 60% of the populated areas covered now. Yeah. And so how do, you, how do you create the 3D data? I mean, I assume that you don't have 3D modelers like going in and going, okay, today's the good thing is the Pike Place market in Seattle. It, right. That just, that just <laughs> wouldn't scale. Um, so the process involves first uh, flying high-resolution imagery. And this is, it's not widely known because other providers often refer to it as satellite imagery, but all of the really high-resolution imagery, the five centimeter per pixel stuff, has to come from aerial uh, photography, where we fly an aircraft over a city, and it has a very specialized uh, high-resolution 280 megapixel camera oh. that takes pictures that look both straight down and to the side and front and back, so you get views that are angled as well as straight down. And it basically just goes back and forth across the city in a lawnmower pattern, taking a picture every second. The result is tens of terabytes of data that they, we run through a very specialized process in an Azure compute cluster um, to create the 3D models from all of those overlapping images. Oh, wow. Um, so what are some of the kind of the future considerations? I know that you all are kind of open with sort of like, hey, what are we doing? What, do, what does our roadmap look like? What are some of the things that are sort of on the horizon that you all are now sort of investigating? The scenario that we've primarily targeted for this first release is, like I said, the virtual tabletop map, uh, where you can have collaborative people looking in on the same virtual map. We've also heard from developers that there's a lot of interesting scenarios around where they want to have more of an immersive field of view. So rather than just have a, a map with strong edges to it, they want it to go out to the horizon, be able to stand there and look as you would when you were standing in first person. We also want to bring more of the vector data that we have available to annotate the map. Without labels and metadata as to what's there, um, the map is nothing more than just a terrain visualization, which is useful, but it's much more useful to be able to uh, say, oh, this is that city, this is that road, this is the business that's sitting there, and not just look at the picture. We also want to have uh, the ability for developers to add more of their own context in. One of the scenarios we've heard a lot uh, in architecture, for example, is they want to be able to visualize, well, what would happen if I removed this building and put my own building there? So we want to be able to edit our data, flatten it out, and then put a new model in, in its place. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, so again, uh, thank you very much um, for uh, taking the time to chat with us about this. Um, I'm assuming that uh, folks can go online and find, find where it's at. Um, at uh, you know, Bing, I assume, that yep. you can use to search for it? <laughs> yes. So if you look for it, the uh, Maps SDK, a garage project, is the official name. Uh, and we've got some blog posts up on the Bing Maps blog that point to all the documentation. All right. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you very much uh, for uh, taking the time to uh, talk with us and chat with us. And uh, we will have more on uh, Microsoft Build Live.